Hey everybody. Thank you guys for coming up tonight. It's a really, really good turnout. I want to say that uh, I am Brian McGrath. I'm the director of the health department here in town and I work with the Board of Health. And uh, one of our main goals is to promote public health. And in that, one of the things we do is uh, to educate and promote uh, prevention and awareness, which is why we're here tonight. So I just want to thank a few people for coming up tonight. <clears throat> thank Karen Ibbotson, who's our public health nurse, for organizing most of this. So thank you, Karen. <clears throat> and thank the New Center for uh, getting all of our child care volunteers here tonight. And I want to thank the school department for letting us uh, host in their building. Thank you. And thank EJ from the police department and Jeff Machines from the fire department for setting up their tables. The IT department for all the advertising. The uh, Nothing Can for taping tonight and we're going to put this on their website so we can watch it later. So if somebody couldn't make it here tonight, we can watch it at a later date. And MVP ASAP, which is a group that's a nonprofit that you guys are all familiar with. They have a table and Libby and Phil are here from their group. And uh, they're going to be here on the 31st with the Improbable Players for a theatrical uh, performance and a quarterly meeting. And that's on the 31st at 6.30 in the Improbable Play. So, looking forward to that. So I'm going to introduce uh, Deanna Cruz, who is new to our town government and our new community benefits, community support coordinator. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Who's excited to be here? This is very exciting, actually, and I'm so happy that you have all turned out. And uh, for whoever watches this on television, I'm excited for you as well because. <laughs> okay, there we go. <coughs> Don't move. Okay. Prevention is very important, and education is very important. Um, my role here in the town is community support coordinator, brand new role, just started in September. And my role is to help all the residents and members of the North Andover community with behavioral health needs. So it's a pretty big umbrella and can encompass things like addiction issues, mental health issues, or just life adjustment issues. If you're having uh, issues in your family, issues with your kids and school adjustment, um, that's what I'm here for. My office is in Town Hall on the second floor. You can drop in anytime. It's best if you call me sure I'm there. Um, you can make an appointment, I can come to your home, I can meet with you and your child at school. I'm here to support you. My information is in um, the table, halfway back there, and also on the table with the police department outside. So please take my cards. Um, you may not need support today, but you might need it someday. Um, your neighbors might need it, so please reach out, and you can just come in and chat and say hello, that's great too. Um, so I'm very excited that we have such a wonderful presenter here tonight that is going to explain the very complex issue of addiction and the nature of addiction being a disease of the brain. It's very important that we all understand that uh, so that we can better assist people with addiction issues. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Poti who is a family physician and also an expert in addiction treatment. And here she is to give us our wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's really great to be in North Andover. It's not a town I remember having been to. I've never been to this beautiful school. But I also want to just acknowledge, as a Massachusetts resident, how outraged I was by what happened here in September. Um, and I'm sorry for your community and the tragedy and the local tragedy. And, you know, us in Western Mass, we're pissed at Columbia Gas, too. It's really outrageous. So just as a town person, um, we all felt at least some portion of what you all went through, and it was unimaginable. So I'm really sorry for everyone that still suffers locally. Um, I haven't given this talk in all of like three weeks, so I may be rusty, because I usually take a break over the holiday. So I'm going to turn around and look at where, where I am in my slide deck sometimes, but usually uh, it goes pretty smoothly. This slide deck is available to anybody who wants it in the room. Caroline has a sign-up sheet in the back where you can put your email and she'll email it to you. And you could go take this slideshow and go give it anywhere you want next week. You can cut and paste slides. You'd give me no credit, credit all yourself, but you could give it in a health class. You could give it in a Sunday school. You could use 
it in treatment, actually. It's a very effective tool to help people who are in recovery. So we're going to talk about this extraordinary organ in the brain, in the body called the human brain. And I think people sort of think that all of these parts of your body are shifting all the time. The truth is when you're born, you have these, for most of us, two functional kidneys and a functional pancreas that do the same thing on our what of life as they do on the final hour of your life. But the brain is an organ in the body that is actually shifting tremendously. In particular, it shifts tremendously in the first 24 years of life. So we're gonna spend time talking about how the brain changes, especially what's happening in middle school and high school. Um, this is the cover of National Geographic a little over a year ago. It was September of 2017, and it was entitled the, basically The Physiology of Addiction. And before you go give your talk at the local um, health class, you might want to go read this article because there's a lot of also very good online video that reminds us how complicated the pathways are that are disrupted with addiction. It's not one single pathway that goes awry, it's many. Um, and so there's many good resources online to talk about it. I am going to talk you through the pathway that's well understood, it's most easily understood by all of us, and it really, I think, uh, it, does it, it does the disease justice in some ways. And that is that the part of the brain that breaks with addiction is the part of the brain that tells us to survive. The most elemental, ancient part of the brain, the reward circuit, the thing that tells you to get out of bed and find food and find water and find a mate to send your genetic material forward, that's the part of the brain that breaks when you get addicted to something. And if we could pick up the disease of addiction and just move it to your visual cortex, and all you did is you lost your peripheral vision when you got hooked on alcohol, then I wouldn't let you drive at night, and I wouldn't let you pitch on a pitcher's mound, and I'd get you some corrective lenses and some eye exercises, and we would be done. But instead of the part of the brain that tells you to live or die every single day, that's what breaks with addiction. It is the reason why prevention matters more than anything else, because addiction is truly a preventable disease. It is a disease that we could stop in its tracks if we were able to recognize it early enough and we were able to help target people who are most at risk. That's not true for most disease I take care of in the day. Most diseases I take are somewhat preventable, but addiction is profoundly preventable. So racing through the circuit of the brain, the reward circuit of the brain, is the neurotransmitter that everybody in this room knows about. And that's dopamine, right? It's What does dopamine make you feel like? That's right, super yay, in fact. Euphoric, awesome. Um, this sort of sense of, holy smokes, that was great, do it again. It has with it associated fine motor skills. And so sometimes when people struggle with addiction, they'll say, look, I'm no longer drinking, but I miss mixing that martini so much. I miss uncorking the bottle. People who shoot an IV heroin or other drugs will say, I miss the works. I miss loading up a syringe. I miss finding a vein. I'm sometimes hunting for veins on my body, even though I've been sober for three years. Because the finger aspect also races through the dopamine circuit. And what needs to happen actually in treatment centers and in recovery and in therapy with people with addiction is you need to keep their fingers occupied. And I have therapists who taught themselves to knit so they can teach their clients to knit. Because when you distract your fingers, it quiets down the brain wanting to use. And that's, again, true for anything. For those of us who've struggled with cigarettes, I mean, you got to do something with your fingers when you stop smoking. Otherwise, you'll just eat, right? That's what we all do. That's our occupation with our fingers. When we stop smoking, we all gain 50 pounds. It's hard to do. So the other th behaviors associated with dopamine in the brain are two specific behaviors. One is called perseveration and the other one is compulsion. I am unable to stop thinking about this. I must do it. And when it comes to survival, those two behaviors, being compulsive and being perseverating, are fabulous. Those kept your ancestors alive. You are grateful for those behaviors. My front row, they were terrible at those two behaviors, and they don't exist anymore, right? So your ancestors went to bed every night, and the last thing they thought of is, how am I going to get enough calories to keep my people alive? Because you know how hard it was to live in North Andover 200 years ago, for, forget 2,000 years ago, you were hungry all the time. You just were. We were all really hungry. And every now and then you would find some, some giant school of fish swimming up the river and you kept your family alive for two more weeks. And then after a while you thought, I need to move down the river because there's nothing here for me to eat. So those behaviors of compulsivity and perseveration help you survive. I know my sound is going in and out. Is it making you nuts? a little bit. I don't know how to fix it. 
Um, I think I'm not loud enough without the mic, but do you want me to try it for a second? No, keep going, just keep going and try not to, okay. I don't know how to stop whatever it's doing. Um, so those behaviors of perseveration and compulsion define addiction. And for those of us that work with people who struggle with addiction, it can be really frustrating because you're like, I, I just saw you here like a month ago or a week ago. I'm seeing you all the time. What is wrong with you? You need to get better. But you need to remind yourself, those are the behaviors that define addiction. I cannot stop thinking about it and I simply must do this thing. So I make an argument that we all have a set amount of dopamine in our brain. And there's some of us who are these happy, go lucky, golden retrievers on the planet. I have one living with me right now. He's in the audience. He's a Boston University third year medical stu student named Stuart. He's a golden retriever. He has baseline high dopamine. His set level isn't 100. He's like 110 every day, which is fabulous. It's really great to have a golden retriever in your house, right? It's a nice, nice thing. I actually have baseline low dopamine levels. I bet my baseline dopamine is like 90 most days, but I know what it takes for me to feel good. I exercise a lot. I cook. I bake a lot. I do things that make me feel better and it brings my dopamine up. So on average, those of us in this room sitting here, we have about 100 units of dopamine in our brain. Now, you are not going to call your family doctor tomorrow and ask for your dopamine levels. That doesn't really exist. But it's a way of sort of measuring the normal human experience. So this is the problem, is that here I am describing how um, behaviors impact dopamine. So the way the brain is designed is it wants to, you to continue behaviors associated with survival. So you find that school of fish swimming up. Is this the Miramac? What river is this? Miramac? No. Yeah. You find that school of fish swimming up the Merrimack River and you get a spike in dopamine because your brain is saying, holy smokes, awesome, that's a bunch of protein, you're going to keep your family alive. Your dopamine goes to 150 and then it goes back to normal. You have sex, it's consensual, your dopamine goes to 200 and then it goes back to normal. Those are behaviors that are consistent with surviving on this planet, right? And that at a baseline is what we are designed to do. At the end of the day, after the zombie apocalypse, your brain will return to this. How do I keep my people alive? How do I send my genetic material forward? That is a, a quality that is in every being on this planet. So when you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine will spike to about 350. When you use a drug like a strong prescription opiate or heroin or fentanyl these days, your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will go to 1300 or higher. So doesn't it seem like every one of us should have gotten up and done a hit of meth this morning, right? Because that seems like an awesome idea, right? Except it isn't such an awesome idea. So let's talk about how it works. I'm not going to do this with everything. But every addictive behavior, every addictive substance impacts dopamine. At the end of the circuit, it impacts dopamine. And so we could do this with every addictive behavior or substance. I'm going to do two of them quickly. Cocaine. There's three things in the dopamine equation in the brain. How much dopamine is made, how many dopamine receptors are receiving the information on the other side of the synaptic cleft or the active part of the, of the brain, and how many little vacuums are, are zipping in there to suck dopamine out. Those are the three things. Cocaine works, it turns off the vacuum. It's all it does. Shuts down every vacuum in sight, and so building up in the active part of the brain, the synaptic cleft, is increasing levels of dopamine. That's how you get to 350. You would think that cocaine use disorder would be easy to treat because the mechanism of action is so easily understood. We just need a little vaccine to go in there and, uh, and prevent the vacuums from being turned off. That's all it will take. There's no treatment at this point for cocaine use. We got nothing. If people struggle, I just look at them and say, stop doing that. Bad. Stop. That's the best I can offer people. We're waiting for this treatment to come out. The mechanism of actions for opiates is a co more complicated because it goes through a negative feedback loop through the mu opiate receptor, and it turns um, on GABA, which then shovels out dopamine. So all opiates make more dopamine and shove them out into the brain. But everything we're talking about would impact something in this equation. But this is the problem with the brain. For uh, 200,000 years, we are used to seeing dopamine levels of 110 or 150 or on a really awesome night, 200, right? That is what your brain considers normal over 200,000 years. And when your brain starts seeing dopamine levels of 350, 900, and 1300, it says, oh my gosh, something is wrong here. This isn't okay. Something has gone awry in my brain, and I need to turn down the volume. I'm going to stop making dopamine. I'm going to erase 80% of my receptors, and I'm going to turn on every vacuum in sight. 
So when you struggle with addiction, you wake up in the morning and your new dopamine isn't 100, it isn't even a, a low 85. Your new dopamine set point is a 40. You're miserable. And I'm not saying you're miserable because you're in withdrawal. You're miserable because your brain doesn't have enough functioning dopamine to survive. Like you would never have made it. And your brain is saying, holy smokes, you look terrible, you feel terrible, and you know how to fix this. No one should be sitting at a 40. Go fix it. Go find something. Go dig through your mattress sheets. Figure out if there's a couple nips left over, go scrape something out of the, the wastebasket in the bathroom, make it feel better than this. It actually makes sense to me that people continue to use. It actually makes the most sense to me. What's amazing is that people choose to walk into treatment and say, I am sick, I need help. In order to get from point A to point B, I'm gonna to have to suffer because the suffering is real. No matter how many meds I give them, no matter how much, I am trying to override their brain that is screaming at them to run in use. Again, it would be an easy disease to treat if it weren't in this part of the brain. So it leads to this concept of a broken brain. But I, I wanna talk about something that happened, likely this week, likely this morning, you guys go to the emergency room where? Do you guys go to Lawrence? Most people, okay, so I'm gonna pick on Lawrence, but I wanna be clear, I could pick on any single hospital in the country. I'm just gonna go after my local hospital. So this morning, this guy on the upper right wakes up. It's 5.30 in the morning. He lives in North Andover, and he's having crushing substernal chest pain. I'm gonna go this way, because I think my mic is better on this side. Um, and he looks at his wife and says, it must have been what I ate last night. And she looks at him and says, you look terrible. I don't know what's going on, but I'm calling 911. In a town like North Andover, I've got fire, police, and ambulance at this guy's house. And they look at him, and they look they think this guy looks awful. He's having a massive heart attack, right? They give him a baby aspirin, they give him a nitroglycerin under his tongue, they give him a beta blocker, they put in a big bore IV, and they get an EKG in his living room because they're trying to decide what to do with this guy. They send it to Lawrence General, and Lawrence says, don't send him here. This guy's having a massive interior wall MI. Get, get on 93 South, get him to Boston, out the door now. So, they call Boston, they've warmed up the cath lab. The cath lab says this guy's too sick. This guy is in an operating room getting quadruple bypass surgery in about an hour and a half, right? And they save his life and he goes to the surgical ICU afterwards for another week. He's on the telemetry floor for another week. He gets 12 weeks of cardiac rehab. He gets a new cardiologist, new primary care doctor. He gets depressed after this. He has a new therapist. Lots of things happen for this man. How much money we just spend on him? 50,000, I love you, and I don't know what country you live in, but that's not this country. 50K is basically turning on the lights in the OR. It's warming up the equipment. I would, would anybody else have a number? Yeah, I'd say a quarter million. I, I sent him to Boston, so I'll give you 300,000. We sent him to a partner's hospital. It cost a lot of money, okay? So let's, we dropped a quarter million on him. His next door neighbor in North Andover, Andover is this young woman you see on the floor. She's 24 years old. She went to this high school. She was a soccer star at this high school. And in fact, she got a scholarship to go to BC to play soccer. But when she was 19, playing soccer there, she tore her anterior cruciate ligament. She tore it badly. She couldn't play anymore. She had to have surgery, and she was devastated. And um, her life just fell apart. And she realized that she felt better when she took the oxycodone that the orthopedic surgeon gave her. And he kept giving it to her for quite a while before he was like, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm shutting you down because there's something going on. So she began buying pills on the street. And after a very short amount of time, she couldn't afford the pills on the street. And she started using heroin because it's affordable and it's available. So that was when she was 19, but now she's 24. And she got out of the bad relationship in the bad neighborhood and all the bad people she was hanging out with and she moved back home with her mom. She's going to getting uh, buprenorphine treatment at a lo local treatment facility. She's getting therapy again. She's starting to exercise again. She's realizing that she can be an athlete and not be a soccer player. She's realizing she can graduate from college but not have to go to BC. She's getting her life back on track. She's been actually sober away from heroin for nine months and everything has been good. She just got a job two weeks ago at Dunkin' Donuts. She's feeling like she's on top of the earth. And when her mom knocks on that door at 5.30 in the morning and finds the door locked and nobody responding behind it, her mom freaks out and kicks the door in and finds her daughter lying on the ground blue and not breathing. 
and her mom has been around the block and she's smart. She calls 911 first, she starts CPR, and she administers the first dose of Narcan. And by that time, I got fire and police from North Andover in, in the building, and they have to go through five vials of Narcan before this young woman comes to life again. And they bring her to Lawrence ER, and what happens? They send her home. Anything happened to her before they send her out the door? No. Probably she was made to feel like a piece of dirt. That much probably happened to her. Let me tell you about her next door neighbor, that 68-year-old guy, okay? He had two parents, both of whom had massive coronary syndromes, also in their 60s. He smokes a pack and a half a day of cigarettes. He kicks back a 12-pack of beer every day. And he would go to McDonald's seven days a week if his wife would let him. Instead, he goes four days a week. Does this guy struggle with addiction? Mm -hmm. What's he addicted to? His lifestyle. Yeah, his lifestyle's just a piece of trash, right? He's addicted to most everything. Nicotine, alcohol, fat, sugar, other chemicals that are in McDonald's food to make it addictive. Do you guys think he created his heart attack? He did. I know he had a little genetic risk, but his parents were both smokers. Once I get rid of the cigarettes in this family, there may or may not have been any genetics left over that's playing a role here. This guy created his heart attack. He did. He's to blame. He is to blame. Did anybody roll into his living room or in the ER or in the cath lab and wag their finger and say, you made this bloody mess. I'm going to drop a quarter million dollars on you. Really? Did anybody do that to him? No. Because if I, as a family doctor, every day made my patients feel rotten for making bad lifestyle decisions, I would sit by myself in an office with no patients, right? Because who would ever want to come see me? Who would ever want to walk in to get yelled at by me? Really? <coughs> Nobody. I specialize in chronic disease. I take care of people over a lifespan who have illnesses that sometimes progress and sometimes recede. And my job is to help people make small decisions every day towards a healthier lifestyle. I don't expect miracles. I help just coach people along a healthier path. And sometimes I prescribe medicine and I give advice, right? That's what I do all day long. And until the system recognizes that two, these two human beings are human beings that deserve the best medical care able to be provided in this country, right? Until that happens, we have got to keep at this work. Because this guy deserved to have his heart fixed, right? He deserved to have a conversation about his harm of drinking and decreasing or getting off his cigarettes and never eating McDonald's ever. That needed to happen for him too. But nobody needed to make him feel like a piece of trash. And his next door neighbor, that 24-year-old girl, didn't need to be made to feel like a piece of trash either. You know what that kid needed? Then not a single dollar needed to be spent on that girl. Somebody needed to look at her and said, I heard that you've been doing great. For the last nine months, your life has been awesome. And I'm really proud of you because that's really hard to do. But relapse happens between six and 12 months all the time, every single day, because that's the time when you start to feel better. You feel normal. You feel so good and so on top of the world that you think you can dip your toe in and you'll make it out alive. And these days with fentanyl, you don't make it out alive, right? It doesn't happen that way. And so in fact, as a society, we should acknowledge that this is a really high risk time. Six to 12 months is super high risk. And it's a time where therapists shouldn't be saying, I'm going to see you every two weeks instead of every one week. It's a time where actually getting your first paycheck is trouble and where we should be talking to parents about for the early days, these people can't manage their own money. I'm not trying to treat them like babies, but guess what? Having money in your pocket is burning a hole in your pocket and you want to spend it. So maybe mom just needed to have a conversation about maybe trying to manage her money. We just needed to intensify treatment for this young woman, not make her feel like a piece of trash. I didn't need to spend a dollar. But this is the reason I do this work, because until this stuff starts to change, we as a community need to really work for these young people um, to help advocate for them. So let's go back to the brain and let's go back to dopamine. These are PET scans. These are slices through the brain. And what you see in that middle column are healthy brains with all that orange floating through it. That's dopamine. And those slices through the brains on the left on the right are people who struggle with addiction. The top brain is somebody who uses cocaine. The next one down is somebody who uses methamphetamines. 
The third one down is somebody who uses alcohol, and the final one is heroin. Just stare at the alcohol brain for one minute. Do you see how much orange is still there? It's kind of surprising. But I think as we can acknowledge, alcohol is one of the most damaging substances in our society. It happens to be legal, and it happens to be that many of us partake in it. But it's a harmful substance. It causes a lot of damage to society. Half of our jails are filled with people who struggle with an alcohol use disorder. Um, it causes a lot of harms in families, right? It causes, there's this notion of secondhand alcoholism. Growing up in a family of an alcoholic is not easy on anybody. So the point of that slide, and the, main, the reason I'm talking about it now, is the wheels come off the bus with alcohol use disorder fairly late in the game. There are a lot of us who are functional alcoholics. We live with them, we work with them. It doesn't mean that they need to be shamed or blamed, but we need to acknowledge it's real. 13% of Americans, one, three, 13% of Americans struggle with an alcohol use disorder. I can count on like one finger the number of patients who walked in my office who said to me, I'm a hot mess, I'm in trouble with alcohol, help me. Instead, I have to claw it out of them, or they get hauled in by probation, or I meet them at the jail, or they get hauled in by a partner who says, if this guy doesn't stop drinking, I'm leaving him. Help him, please, right? This is an under-recognized disorder in our society. What amount of alcohol is probably healthy for you? Close to none. Something closer to zero than any. And that is, you know, that's just a fact. We're going to talk about alcohol. I am not going to walk away from that discussion tonight. So three things predispose any one of us or our kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews for addiction. The first one is genetic risk. The second one is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is a history of traumatic childhood events. Having poor mental health does not necessarily mean that you're going to struggle with addiction. Having poor mental health does put you at risk or makes you more vulnerable um, to trying things on a lot earlier. So when you're a 14 year old kid and you feel like you can't fit in and you can barely get to school every day because your social anxiety is through the roof and there's no way that you're going to try out for theater and you never feel like you have a friend in the cafeteria, you're somebody who might start vaping, cigar or vaping marijuana or drinking alcohol because you realize that when you're high, you're the life of the party and it mitigates, at least in your own mind, the anxiety. So what that is is not that anxiety leads to addiction, it's that anxiety is self-medicated with an addictive substance, so it's introducing an addictive substance while the brain is developing that then leads to the addiction. And I think for those of us who are parents in this room of teenagers, our teenagers are a hot mess right now. They are just deeply anxious, freaked out kids. I have a junior. Anybody else have a junior or senior at home? Holy smokes, right? They're nuts right now. I, I mean, maybe other kids aren't as nuts as mine are, but all over the map in terms of emotions and, and lots of tears at my house and a lot of yelling at me. And it's just, it's pure anxiety. They're just freaking out because they have a tremendous amount of pressure on them. And because they look at Instagram and everybody looks happy and perfect every day. Like what kind of life are these poor kids leading? So the genetics of addiction are really intense. It is hard to find a disease in medicine with this level of um, pass through multiple generations. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of struggling with addiction yourself. So who needs to hear that? Everyone, but especially the kids, that's right. And I think that freaks parents out. I think that freaks grandparents out. Like, why would I tell my kids about their genetic risk? I'm telling you the reason you tell your genetic history to your children is because they actually get to rewrite the family genetics. Genetics get to shift if our kids make the right decision. That's the extraordinary thing about telling the kids the truth about what has happened in your family. Now, you don't need to go into the gory details of who and what and why. I didn't tell my kids the who and what and why in my family. I just said we have high risk of addiction in our family, and you three need to make a choice that is going to help lead you away from that path. Because what we know about addiction is it starts while the brain is developing, that all addiction is considered an adolescent developmental disorder. The average age of first use of any substance, alcohol, marijuana, or nicotine is what? Roughly. Yeah, it's 12, 13, 14. 11 is a little on the young side, but I got plenty of people who start pretty darn early. So the average age of first use is 12, 13, or 14. That is 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, okay? 
So if you think the first conversation about drug use is happening sophomore year, I can't even tell you how far the horse is out of that barn. This is a fifth grade conversation. That's when it has to start. Now, the levels of conversation are age appropriate conversations, but I think those of you in this room know that we're going to spend some time on vaping. Vaping is everywhere. I don't care what school district you are, you are in, and we are seeing vaping ha actively occurring at the elementary school level, and so are you if you're paying attention. So. All, adult, all addiction actually starts while the brain is developing. If you get to the age of 23 or 24, never having used an addictive substance, the likelihood of developing addiction is less than 2%. If you have a family history and you wait that long, the rates of addiction go down to 5%. I just dropped my disease rate from 50% to 5%. And how did I do it? I delayed my use. That's why you tell your kids because they get to control that. They get to drive that bus. This should be taught in every biology class. This is basic knowledge about your body. So a 15-year-old who starts drinking, 15, and drinking here is defined as two alcoholic beverages a week, 40% of those 15-year-olds go on to be alcoholics. If you wait until age 21, i.e. the legal age, to start drinking, the rates of alcohol use disorder go down to 7%, which is not quite half, but a little more than half national rates. So it's just about delaying use. Think of the chasm between a 15-year-old and a 21-year-old. Those are two very different people, and their brains are really different too, and the susceptibility to this disease alter. So it's just about delaying use. That's all, that's all I'm asking. I don't look at my kids with my giant glass of wine in my, hand, in my hand and say, don't ever drink, it's bad for you. I just say, delay your use, delay your use. I don't say delay your use with cigarettes. I'm like, don't ever smoke cigarettes, right? They're trash, They're, they destroy you, don't do it. But delay your use as long as possible. So what we know about our kids, actually, is our kids are amazing. Our kids are making the best decisions, the best decisions, better than everybody else in this room about all substances. And that flies in the face of what you hear. The truth is, this young generation sitting in this high school right now, in general, smokes less everything, uses less alcohol, it, than any other generation in the last 40 years. They're doing a great job. And when I get to talk to high school kids, I spend a lot of time patting them on the back because they're truthfully doing great in their decision making. This is the problem. What do our kids think about cigarettes? They're gross. They're disgusting. They say that. They're, they all have kids in the front row like making the vomiting signal. Like they're revolting to them. This generation will eradicate paper cigarettes. They will. They don't even know who Joe Camel is. They have no idea that that is. That's like an old image that doesn't exist for them. They hate paper, paper cigarettes. They will not smoke. The rates of high school cigarette smoking is something like two to three percent right now. Right? It will go away. But this is the problem. What do our kids think or say about marijuana? What was that? They say it's legal. Okay, of everything you guys are about to say, that's the right answer. It is legal, that's a fact. It's illegal over the age of 21, right? But they do say it's legal. Oh, I just showed you the answer. I'm gonna get rid of that. What else do they say? It's not addictive. They often say that one, not addictive. What else? It, they always say it's safer than alcohol. They always compare it to the other legal drug. What was the other one? It's a plant, it's organic, it grows in the ground, it's better than Prozac, it's not a pharmaceutical. Yep, they say that, what else? Yeah. It won't kill you. You can't overdose on it, that's exactly right. Yep, okay, you guys are super smart. I think you named every one of them. Yeah, oh, it's medicine, it helps me. It helps me sleep, it helps my anxiety. I'm better in history class when I sit in the back and I'm high. I have kids tell me they're better on the athletic field when they're high, and I look at them and I'm like, you tell me what sport you perform in where having very slow reflexes helps you. Like, what sport is that, really? <laughs> tai Chi, I guess if you're like doing professional Tai Chi or something. Anyway, but this is what the kids will say, and this is, and this is universal. This is what this generation has, believes very deeply about marijuana. So let's spend more time than anybody in this room ever wanted to spend on pot, okay? I'm going to just turn sideways a little to see where I am. Okay, so let's talk about the developing brain. Between the ages of 12 and 24, I'm going to focus on the middle school and high school age here. Three very specific things happen to the brain. The first one is called synaptic refinement. And synaptic refinement is when you prune back all of these extra connections or neurons in the brain. You have 
tens of billions of these things in your brain at the age of 12. It is a hot, tangled mess. And if you do not successfully prune back, get rid of a big chunk of them, you actually end up with a profoundly unhealthy brain. So our teenagers are actively, they don't, they're not aware they're doing this, they are gutting their brain in mostly a positive way all the time. There are times during adolescence where you lose 30,000 synapses a second. I sometimes am looking at my kid thinking, they're losing 30,000 synapses right in front of me right now, right? The second thing that happens during this stage is myelination, or in sheathing or in insulating really rapid decision-making pathways in the brain. It's about building a super highway out of some dusty country roads and actually getting rid of super dusty country roads you no longer need. These two things have to happen to have a healthy brain. And it is a reason why our kids' brains are amazing and extraordinary and terrifying and super hard to parent because their brains are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is scaring the heck out of most of us. These brains tend to be very poor impulse control. They better, they there tend to be act first, think later, very low belief in consequences for anything. There's never a time in your life where you're more influenced by your peers, ever. You have a lot of strong desire for physical activity and sensation seeking. Um, and this is known as the age where you are hypersensitive to social exclusion. And I want to pause on that concept for a minute. There's never a time in your life where you care as much about what other people think. There just isn't. When you're in second grade, and you're seven years old, and you're sitting by yourself at the cafeteria with your bologna sandwich, you're like doodling on a piece of paper or making a hat out of a napkin. You really didn't care. And when you're 24, and you're at your first job, and you're by yourself, you don't care either. You're reading the New York Times on your phone, and you're eating your salad. You're good. But when you're 14 or 16, and you're by yourself in this cafeteria, or sitting on the bleachers in that auditorium, and no one is with you, you think every eye in the universe is on you. You're wondering what stupid thing you said in math class that made this happen. You're worried you smell bad, you look bad, you have the wrong shoes, the wrong hair, it's because you missed the goal in field hockey. It is a thousand things. But it's all about how it feels to not be included. That defines who you are when you're an adolescent. This is, I'm going to turn because I never can remember it. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. That's a teenager. And if I have an adult in the room that finds that true for themselves, you need a therapist. I need to find you a therapist. Because <laughs> this is not a good way to be. This is a dreadful way to be. And it's a reason why most of us, who in this room would go back and happily go back to middle school and high school, live it all over again? Anybody? There's always one. Where's my one? There's one person. Okay, right back there, right? And I, you don't get to go back and relive it as, as an adult brain going in and kicking some butt, like being superhero back in high school. You have to go back and schlep around your 14-year-old self. So there's my one. Maybe my dopamine golden retriever there said yes to, but most of us wouldn't go back because this, quite honestly, this looking glass self feels awful. And it's the reason why our kids are so heavily influenced by their peers, because quite honestly, they just want to fit in. They just don't want to be excluded, right? And it's why you knowing who your kids' friends are, it really matters, right? And so my kids hate it, but I actually think they secretly like it when I'm driving and I'm schlepping a bunch of teenagers around in the back and I start plowing in. I talk about birth control, I talk about sex, I talk about drugs, and my kids are like, Mom, be quiet, but their friends are like, really, tell me more, and then what, and then what? Because the truth is, I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with this stuff, because those people in my back seat are hanging out with my girls, right? That's all I'm doing. Not, I'm not doing, I'm, I tell their parents sometimes before I do it as well. Okay, three, the third thing that happens in the, in the teenage brain is we lay down those final dopamine receptors in the brain. And what becomes active at this stage is one of the um, receptors in the brain that helps determine what gets pruned, what gets thrown away, and what gets kept. And it's a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid called anandamide. So that was a super long, multisyllabic sentence I just did, but it's a naturally occurring neuroendocannabinoid. And anandamide looks just like THC, which is the psychoactive component in marijuana. And in fact, your brain cannot tell those two things apart. So while your brain is developing as an adolescent, THC, or the drug, the part of marijuana that makes you high, is a neurotoxic drug to the developing brain. It is like using a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel to figure out what gets pruned and what gets kept. 
That is the problem with pot. I don't really care what you do after the age of 25 in your own home, in your own basement, as long as you do not get on my roads, you do not operate on my knee, change the lug nuts on my tire, or babysit my kids, stay away from people, or just live in your own basement with your pot, that's fine with me, I don't care. I don't think it's worse than alcohol over the age of 25. The problem is, this is an industry that is hell-bent on making sure our young people get hooked on pot. When your job is to sell an addictive substance, your job is to make sure that young people are hooked because you guys all understand that all addiction starts while the brain is developing. That's just the way it works. So yeah, the legal age may be 21, but I have yet to see any success in keeping marijuana out of the hands of our kids. So when you look at what marijuana does, it has an impact on attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed, and that stays even when you're not high. When you look at the studies from New Zealand and Australia, this is going to compare two extremes because it's easier to understand. It's studied over a period of 25 years. People who used marijuana between the ages of 14 and 21 zero times, and I'm going to compare it to kids who used marijuana in that same span of time, age 14 to age 21, 400 times or more. So the red line is the 400 times or more. The little light gray line is the zero use. So graduating from college by age 25, 36% of the kids who used marijuana zero times graduated from college. 2% of the kids who used marijuana 400 times or more graduated from college. When you look at unemployment rates at age 25, kids who used marijuana zero times were unemployed at a rate of 21% by age 25. Kids who used marijuana 400 times or more, 52% were unemployed. That for me is my kids not launching. That's for me. I like my kids. I actually love my kids. I want them out of my house. I want them graduated. I want them to go to school. I want them to pay taxes and walk their own dog. I don't want them living at my house. I want them to succeed. This for me is a failure to launch, right? Marijuana is a performance degrading drug. It is never a performance enhancing drug. There's a lot of sense. It makes me better. And I'm happy to talk at question and answers about some of the medicinal uses maybe for marijuana that have some evidence behind them. But when it comes to recreational use, my worry, the reason I do this work in a public health prevention world is to prevent this from ending up in the hands of our youth. So there's a drop in IQ in the same study by eight points by the age of 35. And this is the problem, is that every study we have on marijuana, first of all, doesn't happen in the US because we don't fund it. It's a Schedule I drug. You can't use federal dollars to study Schedule I drugs. Every study we have is from outside. But most every study we have is done in the 1990s or 2000s, back when pot used to be THC levels of 3% or less. There is no field-grown marijuana in the entire country that's 3%. That doesn't exist anymore. It all sits between 9% and 18% right now, and it keeps climbing, right? It doesn't exist. The old pot that maybe people in this room used to use and said it was all good all the time, it's like comparing Tylenol to fentanyl. They're not the same drug. You cannot compare these two drugs. Okay, and this is the other issue. So maybe my stuff I'm growing in my field in Northfield, Massachusetts is 16 or 18% THC, but I go to the store and this is really what I get. I get the concentrates, or if I'm a smart chemist, I make the concentrates at home. So you extract the THC from the bud and this is what you end up with. Hash oil, butter, shatter. This stuff sits between 50 and 90% THC. And this is what is both available, this is what you can buy, and this is what most of our kids understand is marijuana. If you saw this in your kid's room and like in the hidden place site, most of us would be like, ew, what's that disgusting thing? And we'd pick it up at the Kleenex and throw it away, right? Because this stuff looks gross. It is super potent pot. And there's a gazillion ways to get it into your system. You can eat it, you can vape it, you can put it as a tincture under your tongue, you can rub it on your skin as a salve. Um, and the most common way that people use it is as an edible mixed with sugar and chocolate. So this is stuff that comes out of the um, North, I'm sorry, out of the Colorado stores. And you can see it's intended for kids. There's no way you can convince me this stuff is not marketed to children. My little old ladies with cancer using marijuana are not eating a Kit Kat bar. That's not what they use. So what is different in Massachusetts? So first of all, we in fact, 
said very clearly in the law or the uh, referendum ballot measure that we passed in November of 2016 that all edibles will be available at stores, period. Um, the limitations that the Cannabinoid Commission have come up with is there cannot be look-alike candy. So you can't have a kefir cat that clearly looks like a Kit Kat. But you could have an orange wrapped wafer chocolate bar with four bars in it, which everybody knows is a Kit Kat, right? But you can't sort of do a spoof on the name. You're not allowed to do gummy animals in Massachusetts. You could do gummy spheres and gummy cubes, but no animal shapes. This for me is like just the margins here though, right? This is little stuff. Edibles are everywhere, and the truth is, so yeah, you have to be 21 to walk into a Massachusetts dispensary, but how old do you have to be on the internet to get this stuff shipped to you? Probably 21. What does it take to be 21 on the internet? Click. 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 I'm 21, right? So this stuff gets mail ordered all over the place. Uh, is it addictive, right? Because kids feel very deeply this is not an addictive or harmful drug. <coughs> so we used to say marijuana wasn't so addictive. Back in the old days when it was 3% THC, i.e. the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the addictiveness of marijuana was about 9%. Cigarettes are 34%, is that what they're? 32%. So it used to not be so addictive, but when you start as a teenager, the addiction rates are about 17%, and when you use today's marijuana with the potency of THC, the addiction rates are between 30 and 40%, 30 and 50%. So it's more addictive than nicotine. That's what we have. It is more addictive than nicotine. It is not less addictive. Is it true you will not die of an overdose? I'll give you that one. You're not going to overdose and have respiratory failure from marijuana. You might have your first or second or 15th psychotic episode. That's true. And what we're seeing and what was seen starting in 2012 in Colorado is the ERs are just filled with kids who are psychotic. Or people my age who just kept eating their candy because they didn't feel any effect. And before they knew it, they'd taken 12 or 18 servings of marijuana and then they're psychotic. So our kids at this age are using more marijuana than cigarettes. This is last year or two years ago was the first time those bars crossed each other. And um, most kids aren't using pot though. The vast majority of kids are not using marijuana. It's a small number, but that small number is really loud. Right? It's that small number that get caught in the locker room and they get kicked off the basketball team or they're, they're smoking on the bus and they talk about it at school. So if you ask your kids what percent of your classmates are smoking marijuana, what do they say to you? Everybody does it, right? But you know, my daughters do that and I'm like, not everybody smokes pot. I know that. I'm the school doctor. I know that they don't. And I'm like, count on your hands how many people you know really smoke. And they come up with like not many, right? But you have a sense that everybody's doing it because high school is that way. High school really uh, makes things that are exciting or drama filled super loud and it just takes the, all the air out of the room. So let's talk about alcohol for a minute. One third of us in this country drink nothing, nothing ever, we never drink, okay? One third of us in this country drink very lightly, a drink a week, a two drinks a month, very, very light social drinkers. And the final one third of us drink every drop of alcohol in the country. And the final 10% of us drink on average about 10 drinks a day, okay? Now most of my people drinking 10 drinks a day aren't here because they've started already. To get 10 drinks in you, you gotta start pretty early, right? But I have patients who drink 40 drinks a day, right? Because I'm an addiction doctor, so I take care of a huge spectrum of very heavy drinkers. But this is a lot of Americans who drink a lot of alcohol, and it's easy to drink a lot of alcohol. That's the problem, is that a drink is a 12 ounce, 5% beer. Most of us actually drink possibly a much stronger, hoppier, more high alcohol beer. Who's a bartender in this room? Nobody bartended? I used to be. Okay, right there, okay. So uh, hard alcohol is 1.5 ounces. How many drinks might be in a cocktail? One and a half. Yeah, it could be, yeah. So, but when you're mixing a cocktail, you might be mixing a couple three 1.5 ounces in, meaning that an or it depends, it depends on the drink. Tea, that's two to three drinks. Right, so if it's a martini, it's two to three drinks. Now most of us count our martini as one drink, but we need to stop for a minute and acknowledge that 1.5 ounces is considered a drink. And that one martini you had, i.e. maybe three martinis you had, each of those is two to three drinks. You have a Long Island iced tea, that's six drinks, right? So you've got to keep up with the math in your head. 
This is our biggest problem these days, is the following. I ask my patients all the time, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And my women say, oh, you know, I have a couple glasses at night. And I say, what are you drinking? I drink wine. How much do you pour? Oh, you know, I pour a regular size wine glass, right? Because our wine, my wine glasses at home are huge. They're like giant thick wine water goblets because they go through my dishwasher and they do not hold five ounces. If I put five ounces, which is a glass of wine, in my wine glass, it will look pathetic. It will be embarrassing. I can't do that, right? So women, more than anybody else, have altered their relationship to alcohol. And more and more women aren't pouring five ounces at night. They're really pouring 10 to 12 in every glass, and they're having a couple, three of those, right? So women are drinking half a bottle, three quarters of a bottle, or a bottle and a half of wine every night. It used to be the case 20 years ago in this country. The ratio between male alcoholics and female alcoholics was nine to one. In the last 15 to 20 years, it has shifted to six to three. That is a massive shift in public health, and nobody talks about it, right? Because I think it's not staring people in the face unless you live with a woman who's struggling with alcohol. I take care of young, healthy women who are not um, so healthy anymore because they're struggling with a serious alcohol use disorder. This has become a very common phenomenon. And it's just normalized. Like, think of the last time you went out with your girlfriends and you didn't drink. Think of the last time you had a party and alcohol wasn't prominent. This world of selling alcohol to women is everywhere. It's hard to go to like a little boutique store and not see like tea towels and coasters all about wine and women. It's become very normalized. So I get this at the end and I finally just put in some slides. People will say, look, I think it's good to teach your kids to drink before they go to college. And I sit there and think, that doesn't make sense to me. You've got a 16 or 17 year old still developing brain. You're not doing them any favors by exposing them to alcohol. So they've done studies on what it looks like when parents give their kids alcohol. Do these kids do better? Do they, they do worse? They do worse. They have higher rates of alcoholism and higher rates of addiction um, to alcohol. So don't think that by hosting a post football game party in the basement of your house with alcohol, you're doing anybody any favors. First of all, it's against the law. I hope the police come to your house and bring you to jail because that is outrageous behavior and you're not benefiting anybody. Do I want your kids drunk on the road? Of course I don't. The message to your kids is I don't want you drinking, but if you are ever in trouble at any time, any time of night, I will come get you and I will not say a word. The next day I may say a word, but I will get you safely home 100% of the time. That's my responsibility. But don't be hosting parties at your house and giving your kids alcohol. My alcohol is under lock and key at my house. Right? I know how many beers are in my fridge, I count them, but the rest of my alcohol is in a cabinet with a key. And when I came home with that lock many years ago, my oldest kid looked at me and he was like, Mom, what's up? You don't trust us? And I was like, no. You're a teenager. Why would I trust you, right? I went to high school in the 80s. I know what we did with our parents' liquor cabinet. I am not going to make this easy for you, right? I'm not going to be the one that's going to be your source or your friend's source. Not happening. So other people have said, but what about in Europe, right? They drink all the time in Europe. The 12-year-olds are drinking. Those people are all good. So I was like, huh, I know that's people's perception, but let's really dig into that one. So this is the top 25 countries in the world and what the rates of alcohol addiction. The first 25 countries, only two are not in Europe. South Korea and South Africa. South Africa's number 25. Every one of the top 25 highest rates of alcohol use disorder in the world are European countries, period. So starting early is not protecting these kids. It's harmful. OK, third thing that predisposes you to addiction. I know that was a million years ago. Genetics, early exposure. The, herd th the third thing is something called having an adverse childhood experience or growing up in a household that's full of chaos and harm. And I'm going to whip through this because I have some younger people in the room, but I actually think most everybody in the room can handle this. This is a study that came out in 1996. And in this study, they had a specific question they thought were, they were answering, but it ended up being they answered a bunch of things that were unintended. They asked adults, 17,000 adults in Kaiser Permanente, San Diego, what happened to you growing up in your household? 10 questions, yes or no. Did good these things happen to you? And then they compared them to 50,000 Kaiser patients looking at um, incidents of, of other diseases. So I'm not going to read every question. I'm going to read some of them. Nobody can read this. I can barely read it, but I'm going to read the best I can. Did a parent or another adult in the household, often or very often, swear at you, insult you, pu push you, put you down or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid? Did a parent or another adult in the household, often or very often, push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you, or thought you were important or 
special, or that your family didn't look out for each other? Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and that you had no one to protect you, or that your parents were too drunk or too high to take you to the doctor when you were sick? Were your parents separated or divorced? Was there somebody in your household who was incarcerated? Was there somebody in your household with major mental illness? Was there somebody in your household who um, had a substance use disorder? I may have missed one. 10 questions, yes or no. If you score a six or a higher on an ACE score, you basically have shortened your life by 20 years. It's not your fault, but the impact of that trauma and those experiences early in your life has an impact on the development of every organ in your body. And if you score a four or higher on the ACE score, you have a much higher incidence of emphysema, which is also known as COPD, asthma, heart attacks. It actually predicts for every chronic disease out there with the exception of diabetes and strokes. It's one of the biggest predictors of who's gonna have addiction. Because when you're a kid who's growing up in a household with a lot of chaos, when you have a lot of fear, when you yourself are worried about being hungry, you live in this chronic state of fight or flight, of sympathetic response, of living in fear, like you're a scared rabbit. That's how it feels, and it doesn't feel that way for 20 minutes, the way a scared rabbit might feel. It feels that way every day of the year for years on end. And that adrenaline, that cortisol in the brain is considered a toxic drug to the brain. And it impacts the development of other organs and consequently impacts the development of disease. Here I am telling you that this is truly a preventable disorder. We know what causes it. We know that preventing it happening while your kid's brain is developing. We know that kids who are at high genetic risk, and we know that our kids who are exposed to a lot of trauma are our high risk people. If we were a society that spent a huge amount of time and resources helping these kids out the most, we could prevent a very deadly and very expensive disease, right? So three things. Genetics, early exposure, and childhood trauma. And my message is just talk to your kids. Like, talk to your kids, talk to them a lot, and task them to delay their use as long as possible. If you have a kid who has a high trauma score because they grew up in a household that was pretty chaotic, or you adopted a kid, or fostering a kid out of a lot of chaos, get them awesome treatment, trauma treatment. And it's gonna take time, it's gonna take money, but we have to acknowledge what trauma does to our kids and try to help them heal with it. So I told you that our kids are doing awesome. They are making best decisions on cigarettes and alcohol. Illicit drugs are flat, and that's mainly because of um, marijuana. But this is the exception that everybody in this room knows, which is the use of vaped products and the use of e-cigarettes exploded in September of 2017. We had them for a little while, but something happened in the summer of 2017. I need like the social media forensic person, maybe Mason can do it in the back IT area. I need somebody who could figure out what went viral that summer, because something happened. And I've, I'm not a tech person, I just sort of dig around on the computer. But if you dig around on the computer, you'll see that vaping is really heavily promoted and it looks unbelievably cool, because the tricks you can do with that giant plume of vape smoke is really fun to watch. This is one of my late night videos that I want you to go watch because there's a lot of that stuff. Again, summer of 2017, something went viral. We all came back to school and the vaped products were everywhere and they remain everywhere today. Do we have a vaping problem at North Andover High School? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, we do. So if anybody in the room thinks we don't, we just do because there isn't a single high school I've been to where this is not a massive problem. So um, at this point, we think about a third of our high school uh, 10th graders are vaping. Um, and the problem is that if you ask the kids, what is it you think they're vaping, what do they tell you? Well, so water is one of the things they'll say, and they'll say flavor. And in fact, many people will just say, it's just water and flavor. But the smarter ones acknowledge they probably are getting some nicotine. If they're paying any attention, they are. So this is a study that came out last February, so less than a year ago, that surveyed 70 American-made e-juices, the things that refill your vape pen. And these weren't the ones from China, which is, by the way, the vast majority of the market. These are the ones made in the US. Every one of them was labeled zero milligrams of nicotine. What percent of them had nicotine in them? I love your cynicism. 90%, 90%, only 90% had nicotine in them. But can you imagine that false labeling? Can you imagine, I mean, how is that happening in this country? How can something be labeled zero milligrams of nicotine and actually have the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes in it? That is outrageous. Who is protecting our kids? 
Uh, nobody, right? The FDA began to get involved in this. So what happened, it's complicated, but they were supposed to have sorted out their labeling and get it down right by the year 2018, and then they got a pass. And they got a pass to go to 2022 to figure out their labeling and get it down straight. And then parents became freaked out, and the FDA stepped in and began sending out threatening letters in September and October of, of 2018 to say, you guys can't really be doing this. So there's been a tiny bit of pullback, but the truth is I got 14-year-olds who are completely hooked on nicotine now. They are nicotine addicts. They can't make it through the day without nicotine. They will get suspended if they vape on, on campus property. So I have nicotine patches on 14-year-olds. I have pediatricians calling me because most pediatricians aren't helping kid, people stop smoking. That's never been in their scope of practice, right? It's in my scope of practice. So they'll call me and say, will you talk me through smoking treatment? Because I got 14-year-olds. I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. I don't know. Has the FDA studied a nicotine patch in a 14-year-old? No, but I'm just still using it. I don't know what else to do. So this is part of it. This, these are the e-juices, and this is what they look like. They come in an apple juice that looks just like a kindergarten apple juice container. They come in a little flavored Ready Whip can that looks like Ready Whip. They come in Nilla wafer. If you think cross-country truck drivers who are trying to quit smoking are using these products, this is intended for our kids. This entire market is the nicotine industry, the tobacco industry, who's about to lose their entire U.S. market, backdooring our kids into a nicotine addiction. That is what is happening here, and it is outrageous. And when the federal government can't protect its people, I say the state steps in, right? If I were the queen, the goddess of the state, I would just, I would, I would ban all of this stuff. It doesn't actually work that well to get people to quit smoking. And instead, what we see is it's really harming our kids. So I know you guys know this. Juul has made some changes. I'll give them a tiny, tiny bit of credit. But Juul's came out and didn't say, we're water vapor and flavor. They came out and said, we're full of nicotine. They didn't lie, but man, they are the coolest things ever. And there's fact even more cool things on the market now. This thing is sleek. It's like an Apple phone. It attaches to your, your computer. It's magnetic. So when the teacher comes by, you can swipe it down. It'll connect to the back of the, of the desk. It's being hidden in toilet paper rolls right now. And you can go into you know stall three in the girl's bathroom and you can vape between classes. Kids sometimes sometimes won't go to the bathroom at school because the bathrooms are so filled with vaporizer and odor and they're disgusted by it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you something that most of you parents or teachers don't know. This is just a fact. So Juul is equivalent to a pack of cigarettes. It has 200 puffs in it. It is more addictive than a pack of cigarettes because when you smoke a cigarette, the first one third of the cigarette has most of the, of the nicotine in it. And then it dissipates as you make it through that cigarette. It starts to go down, not with a Juul. Those, that first hit you take is the same as the 199th hit you take. So it's actually more addictive than a pack of cigarettes. So Juul came out in May maybe November, just a few months ago, and said, we'll stop making the flavors, or at least we'll stop making the flavors to be sold at your local Cumberland farms. You can still buy them all online. They said, we didn't mean for this to end up in the high school. We're sorry. I'm sorry. I don't believe it, right? They made, I don't know, does anybody remember what they made? I think they made a billion dollars last year. Okay. Let's just shift gears for a minute. How are you guys doing? Everybody good? We don't have much more to go. You guys are great. I can't see anybody, but you guys are great. Okay. <laughs> So let's just talk about opiates, because that's, that's what's happening right now. That's what's killing. That's, that's what we're talking about you know, a little bit in the, in the hidden plain sight, because it's the biggest fear that most of us have as parents. And for those of us who are in the addiction treatment world, um, it's, or we're, in, we're a first responder, it's the thing we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's no doubt in my mind that pills were on the hook for this epidemic. The overprescribing of opiates over the last 25 years started this thing off gangbusters. And when you look at our country compared to every other country in the world, we prescribe more opiates than everybody. That doesn't surprise anybody, but we do not have more pain than Canada has. We are the same as Canada. We eat the same, we are the same level of fatness, we have the same level of arthritis and chronic disease yet they prescribe about half as many opiates as we do. Uh, when you look at us compared to every one of the common causes of accidental death, we now have superseded death by car accidents, death by gun violence, death by AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. The number one cause of death under the age of 50 in the United States is death by opiates. That's where we are today, right? Nobody in this room can tell me this isn't an epidemic. I deal with it every single day and I've lost hundreds of patients to opiate overdose. 
So mapping it across the country, 2003 is that first map on that top left. It ends in the year 2014. Those are overdoses, those red areas. And you just watch it spread and spread. 2014 is where the map ends. Fentanyl starts to hit us in 2015 and 16. And at this point, the Northeast is like deep, deep maroon, right? In lots of the country. The Northeast has been particularly hard hit with fentanyl, worse than other places. So the origin of many of the pills and the real epidemic in New England really started to us on what we used to call Oxy Highway or I-95. That Florida had 650 pill mills or pain factories where doctors with American license trained in American medical schools would prescribe medicine and dispense pills for pain. And there was a whole industry of getting on a tour bus and having your way paid down there in your hotel rooms and your food and you, your job on your tour bus from Kentucky is to walk into two pill mills a day and you walked in with a wad of cash that your tour operator gave you and you walk out with a stack of uh, prescriptions and a bag of pills you hand it back to your tour operator you spend another day in the Florida Sun and you go back to Kentucky and Maine and Western Massachusetts and you sell not you but your tour operator sells everything for a massive profit in the year 2009 and 2010 the DEA and the federal government swept into Florida and said if you cannot get this massive problem under control we will shut off all federal funding to your state no highway funds no school funds your state is destroying the eastern seaboard so 2010, these pill mills were shut down and 34 doctors went to federal jail because they were not really doctors, they were drug dealers. Um, and most of those people are still in jail. Um, the problem is now, I have two million, maybe more than that, Americans addicted to opiates up I-95 and my pipeline has been shut down. So what am I left with? Yeah. I am left with an unbelievably pure, cheap, and deadly drug. That's what I am left with. And we were not quite ready for that. I am delighted. I, I cheered when Florida got shut down. But I myself, practicing medicine in Boston and Western Massachusetts, I was not ready for this. Nobody was ready for this. We did not know it was everywhere. It was in every small town. I can text somebody and I can get a bundle of heroin in this lobby in four minutes because that's how widely distributed it is, how high tech it is, how nonviolent it is. This is not a violent drug distribution. You don't hear about gang violence and shootings like we did in the 80s. This thing flies under the radar and building a wall between us and Mexico will not change the way this drug comes to this country, right? It involves small airports, small airplanes, the U.S. Postal Service and FedEx, UPS. That's how it gets here. So this is a complicated map that now that I'm looking at it may be hard to see. That bottom map of the U.S. is prior to 2010, the states with high overdoses dose rates. And it's the top map, once Florida shut down, where you start to see people dying. I want to be clear, glad short Florida got shut down. It's just that as a country and as a public health response team, we weren't ready for this at all. And if I look at other places, I say to them, you've got to be ready for the next step of what's going to happen to you. So starting about 2016 is when we see, start to see the spike in fentanyl, and that's when we really start to see the number of people in Massachusetts and other states dying. This is the amount of fentanyl it takes to kill you. That's a penny, that's fentanyl. For those of you that watch the Hidden in Plain Sight, I think the police officer showed you what a gram of heroin might look like, or two grams. You're not gonna see that in a gram of anything. We don't find heroin anymore. Like, 85% of what's in the state has fentanyl in it. We have fentanyl and marijuana. There was, I, I love this story, and I actually met the Lowell chief of, of the fire department to tell him how much I loved what he did, but I was driving around the state on a Thursday night. This was about a year ago, and I hear at NPR, the Lowell police, uh, fire chief, he's like, look, I don't think you should do cocaine. Cocaine's bad for you. But if you're going to do cocaine, it has fentanyl in it. It's going to kill you. So you've got to use Narcan. You use, co you use cocaine, you've got to have Narcan available. I almost went off the road because I'm thinking to myself, I do a terrible accent of him. I apologize to him. But the notion that I have the chief of a fire department making a massively positive, good public health announcement about cocaine and fentanyl and heroin and stuff that I know this guy didn't even think twice about five years ago. And here he is is giving really solid advice to people who have a drug addiction about how to stay alive. It was just really impressive and it just reminded me how much of a 180 so many people have made and no one has made a bigger and more positive 180 than actually our first responders.
responders. Our first responders, fire, police, EMS, they save lives every day. And they may get pissed off having to save the save life again and again. But my police officers, they just pick people off the street and they bring them to the treatment center. They do it on their days off. They just keep doing it, right? People have really changed. They have changed. People in this room have changed. It's a good shift. It's a positive thing that's happening. Okay, this is a county by county map of the entire country. In those dark counties are counties where there is between 1 and 1.5 bottles of opiate per person as of last year. So there remain states in this country, counties in this country, where there's a bunch of pills still available. The problem is that Medicare changed its rules as of January 1st of this year, and they're going to stop filling these scripts, and pharmacies are refusing to fill them. So what we're going to see is a shift in those dark counties towards heroin, and I'm telling you, they're not ready for this. They're not ready for what New England has been going through for the last seven years. They should be ready because they should be just watching this stuff. They should know what's coming their way. We have sadly led the effort on this. But I expect things to get worse before they get better. The anticipation is 500,000 deaths by opiate overdose in the next four to five years. Right? That's a huge number of people dying. So how do our kids get exposed? In general, our kids make awesome choices and the rates of opiate use in high school and under 20 is less than 2%. It's really low. But where do our kids get opiates? They should never be getting it from your house. Your medicine cabinet, your mother's medicine cabinet, they should be cleaned, empty, and that should have happened seven years ago. That is such old school advice, like get your pills out of your house, unless you're actively using it. If you're actively using opiates for chronic pain or, or Valium for muscle spasm or something else, have it under lock and key. It belongs under lock and key in my opinion. Otherwise, clean out your cabinets and get them to the police take back box in Massachusetts in your local North Andover Police Department. Get them out. They should never get them from you. Where do they get them? They get them because they're prescribed to them, right? They have their wisdom teeth taken out. They get a femur fracture playing ice hockey. Something bad happens to them and the doctor, i.e. me, hands them a stack of scripts or one script. These days, doctors are much better than they used to be. So, does anybody have a story about wisdom? So if you couldn't hear her, her daughter had her wisdom teeth out over the holidays. In her recollection, as she was given four or five days of a bottle of opiates, she let her have them for one day and she got rid of the wet rest. I don't know how many were in that bottle. That's more than I normally hear now. On average, oral surgeons and dentists in Massachusetts are prescribing 12 or fewer. They used to prescribe 30 or 60, right? That's just the way it always was. But these days they're at 12 or less, and many of them are writing for zero. That's how strict it's gotten. So that seemed like a little bit more, and you did the right thing. You limited the use, you made sure she wasn't suffering too much Tylenol and Motrin in conjunction, and then you got rid of them. But this is a shift. This is a shift in how we as prescribers prescribe. So your job as an adult is to protect your kid. And what you do is you look at the prescriber and you say, what can I do to take care of my kid's pain while reducing their risk of being exposed to opiates? Talk me through the plan. Write it down for me. Because the combination of Tylenol, 1,000 milligrams, plus 400 milligrams of ibuprofen is equal to 5 milligrams of oxycodone. Those two drugs, Tylenol, also known as acetaminophen, and Motrin or Advil, also known as ibuprofen, are two different drugs and they work very nicely together. Now, I'm not giving your kid medical advice, right? I'm not giving you medical advice. I'm just telling you what we know. So your job as the adult is to say, tell me how to protect my kid without exposing them to opiates, okay? If you have somebody in your life who you love, who you think struggles with opiates, you need to have Narcan available. You need to know how to use it, right? I have Narcan in my bag. I have it in my car. The police cruisers, they all have Narcan. That is just the way it is in Massachusetts. That's not true in most states. Does North Andover High School have Narcan in the school nurse's office? Yes. Yes, ma'am, it does, because our school nurses have led this effort. You know what it took? It took a bunch of school nurses who said, you know what? We should have Narcan at the school. 
right? I think that seems like a good idea. I have a thousand EpiPens floating around my school. I don't know who might have an overdose. It could be a parent, it could be a janitor, it could be a kid, but why wouldn't I help them with my one Narcan that the company happens to provide for free for the school? But we're the only state in the, co in the country that's like that. And there wasn't a piece of legislation. Nobody mandated it. School nurses got together and said, let's do it. Some of them asked a school committee. We didn't ask our school committee. I wrote an order, handed it to the nurse and said, let's make it happen. And many years later, the school committee found out they were fine. They're all good. But my point is, is that the schools and the school nurses have really advocated for this. So Narcan is available without a prescription at any pharmacy in the state. That is mandated by law. It runs under your insurance. They aren't supposed to say, what do you need Narcan for? Quite honestly, none of their business. But if you have somebody you love, you should get Narcan. If you're a member of Learn to Cope or if you have a family member who struggles and you want to be a part of Learn to Cope, it is a great organization that supports parents and families. They will teach you how to use Narcan and how to get it. There's a bunch of you know YouTube videos on how to use it. It's nasal spray up the nose. What if you give Narcan to somebody who's not in an overdose? Will you hurt them? No, you won't have helped them. If they're having a seizure, you won't have helped them. You need to call 911 first and start basic CPR, but you will not harm them. The only people you will harm is the people who use chronic opiates for pain. And if they're having a seizure, you'll actually put them into withdrawal. But that's a small number, and the truth is you don't, you, and who knows, they could be overdosing just as well, because prescription opiates can cause an overdose. So people get better with addiction, but they don't get wet better just because one thing goes their way. It takes a bunch of change in people's lives to get better. The, so I do this thing with my patients. I draw a circle and I say, everybody gets way better a different way, but in everybody's pie, you must have housing. You must have a safe, sober place to return to. Because if you just go back home and live with the girlfriend who's been actively using with you for the last six months, you will not get better. There's no way you will get better. We can't even pretend that anymore. And what we are missing in this state and in this country more than anything is long-term structured sober living. It doesn't exist. And despite all of the efforts we have made in Massachusetts, we still have limited housing for people who are trying to get better. It is super frustrating for those of us uh, who are trying to help people. I believe in medicine for addiction. I believe in methadone. I believe in buprenorphine. I believe in Vivitrol. I don't think it's 100% of anything. I think it's 30% of the game for some people. I think it's more or less than uh, for others. But you need a lot of things. 12-step recovery, friends, falling in love with yourself, treating your trauma history, you know, getting on meds if you have a major medical psychiatric illness. You need a bunch of things to help you get better. And we aren't great as a society in addressing these needs. There's a bunch of books on addiction that I think are great. I've read all of these. They're by my bedside table. Um, who's read any of these books in the room? What have you read? Uh, the Body Keeps the Score, Clean, uh, Chasing the Scream. This guy's read and read and read. I love it. That's a good list right there. Those are, he's read some of my favorites. Anybody else? Beautiful boy, yeah. Oh, hungry ghost. Okay, he's read them all. He's done. He's, I don't know why he's even here today. Um, anybody else read anything else that they liked? Yeah, in the back? Dreamland. You read Dreamland, good. So Dreamland is the book that talks about the distribution of heroin in the country. And if you're in law enforcement or you're just kind of curious about why we have heroin everywhere, Dreamland is a really good description of how well distributed, how smart, and how high tech it is. Um, the, all of these books, I think, are, are really good. Hey Kiddo, has anybody read that one yet? It's a graphic novel. It just came out a few months ago. It's written by a, a guy who grew up in Worcester whose mom was a heroin addict. Um, and it's intended actually for young adults. I loved it. It was really good. It was just really real about his life being raised by his grandparents in Worcester. So that was my newest one that I like. So these are all great books. I'm going to leave this slide deck up, or this picture up. This is my website. It's just my name. But on my website, which is, again, justmyname.com, um, I have video, I have like a video of this talk. I have articles. Every time I read an article, I think, holy smokes, that was interesting. I put it up on my website. I have a talk I gave to a middle school in Gloucester on the website. I have a bunch of stuff. Um, I was on Anthony Bourdain's show a while ago. That is there. What we do at my jail in Greenfield is on there. CNN came out and did. We, our jail is one of the best treatment facilities, certainly in the state, um, possibly in the country. And that's in a little tiny town in western Massachusetts. So there's good stuff happening out there in Massachusetts, in Rhode Rhode Island and Vermont are really leading the way, so be proud that we're here. Um, what questions do people have? Yes? What about treatment beds? So her question is, what about treatment beds? So when people talk about addiction, they talk about beds. And beds is this concept of coming into a facility, getting stable, 
being held on to, and often, quote unquote, being detoxed. I'm not a believer in detox. You know, people enter into addiction and their brain is broken for quite a while. Seven days in a detox is not gonna make them better. In fact, I will argue it makes them much, much worse. Treatment, and I love the word that you use, treatment beds instead of detox beds, is just that. It is the entry. It is the first step forward on a very long journey of getting your life back on track. And it will go off track a lot of the time. But do we have enough treatment beds in Massachusetts? At this point, we do. They, we really do. You may have to travel a little bit, but there's a statewide network recording the beds available. And you know, when I, 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 when I was walking in here calling my treatment center where I work, um, and we happen to have one male bed, we've been pretty full today. It's cold out, lots of people are coming in. But you can get a bed in Massachusetts. This is the problem is that the longer you stay in place, those are places we need more beds, right? So it's a complicated upside down triangle. We have more, we have plenty of treatment beds, but we don't have enough of the next step. And then we really don't have enough of the 90 day long-term living in the places where you can live for a year with your kid and actually really get better for real. That's what we're missing. So we actually need to invert things a little bit. So right for this minute, treatment beds are good. I really appreciate you asking because five years ago they were bad. So thank you for that. And actually thank Governor Baker because they funded this stuff. Uh, there's another question, yeah. Do you have an opportunity to give this presentation to legislators? I love that you asked that. I think I'm giving a talk to the legislative group in three weeks. Yes, sir, I am. Yep, they asked me to do it and I'm gonna go do a talk. I'm excited about that. And then to follow up, what would be the one or two things you'd ask all of us to say to our legislators that they could change first? <coughs> Are you in the Are you in the legislature? <laughs> what was that? Okay. Um, Tell them to stop the photo opportunities and start giving. It. That's what I. Tell yeah. So first of all, I think that we've taken the, ga the, the the foot off the pedal. I think that we think we've all we're all good. We got this. We've spent enough money. We've done enough. I totally disagree with that. You know, people point to Massachusetts of having a flattening in overdose deaths. That's great. I'm glad fewer people are dying as of last year. But you know what that is? That's Narcan. Narcan is saving people's lives every single day. It's not that our overdose numbers have gone down. It's just that you're dying in fewer numbers. So I'm pausing actually for a really long time because I live in a world. I want to make the right request. So first of all, I think you should pay for prevention. I think that this kind of education should be taught the best evidence, life skills based curriculum should be mandated in every school in Massachusetts. We mandate health education, we fund zero of it. So I think we gotta pay for education to our kids. I think that would have a big impact. I'm gonna say something that you guys aren't gonna be happy with me about, but I am gonna tell you that, you know, when we have three evidence-based treatments available, let's make sure they're really available. Am I in Essex County? Okay, Essex County, where we are standing right now, actually has an opiate problem. Not sure if you guys really knew that. Is it horrible in North Andover? No, not compared to some of your neighbors. But Essex County is right up there as one of the counties with a big problem. Essex County, where we're standing right now, has the least available treatment in the entire state. Your county sucks. It does, it sucks, and I'm horrified by that because I've spent lots of time in Essex County. You have, your access to methadone is really poor. Your access to buprenorphine is severely limited. And that is a problem. We have got to stop treating methadone clinics like a pariah. It is an addiction treatment service. That's all that it is. And people who are on methadone are not a bunch of junkies and addicts. It is a cheap drug that we have had access to for 50 years. In this country, both state and federal, have got to stop regulating it so heavily so that we can actually get it to people who are in need. I am fighting a methadone battle every day. So weirdly, I would talk about our kids and prevention, and I would talk about access to evidence-based treatment to save lives. That's my two things. Thank you for asking that one. Um, so maybe I'll do one more question over here, and then I'll be around for a little bit. Um, what was your question? Um, yeah. um, I was wondering, um, you talk, you, you've talked, and I've heard a lot in the news about um, drugs being laced with fentanyl. Um, is fentanyl in and of itself an addictive drug? Yeah, very, very addictive. So fentanyl, when we talk about fentanyl, I think it confuses people. Fentanyl is a pain medicine that we use for people who have cancer. It comes in a patch form in this country. Um, and, and it's called the Duragesic patch. That's the brand name, fentanyl. And I've used it for the 20-something years I've been a doctor. I use it at the end of life for my 
people who are dying. It's very effective as a patch. So when we talk about fentanyl in this country, we're not talking about that medicine. You would have to have a lot of money to buy that many patches and scrape the medicine off the patch. Instead, fentanyl is manufactured mainly in China. There's a little manufacturing in Mexico. And it's manufactured in labs that are may or may not be associated with universities and the government, doesn't really matter. If you're a pretty good chemist, you can make fentanyl, it's not that hard. And then it gets shipped to this country in UPS packages. You know, at my house, there are packages that come from China all the time, my kids order stuff. Has anybody else had a package that the label was from, and you're like, what the heck? And your kid's like, I ordered new earbuds, and I'm like, that came from China, and they're like, yeah, mom. I mean, that seems so crazy, but that's what it comes in, it comes in packages. And you saw those little tiny grains of fentanyl. You know, it takes a one kilo package of fentanyl to have all of New England covered in fentanyl. It doesn't take much. So it comes to us from China. It's really hard to sniff out, literally hard to figure it out. I'm sure that the US Postal Service and the other inspectors do a great job of pulling everything they can. Um, so it's not being mixed in Mexico with heroin. It, the heroin comes here and then it gets mixed in Fall River and Providence in New Jersey, right? And then it gets distributed. And these days, you know, we do, we see fentanyl and cocaine. There are people who tell me they have fentanyl and marijuana. They're mixing it with a lot of stuff. And it is, it's just incredibly deadly. Um, the high is better. You know, people who are actively using will sometimes look for that. They'll say, I want the good stuff. Um, knowing that it's the risky stuff, but you know, for the bang for the buck, it may be worth it for them. So, so I'll be here for a little while longer. Thanks for having coming out on a freezing cold night on a night that you should be hanging out with your kids doing homework or something. I was glad to be here.